if you have this, you know, some latent artistic ability or talent, you just you pay attention to things visual, things that kind of stimulate you, you creatively. It's all input. And I think most of the success of an artist is the ability to kind of consume lots of input and store it in your, in your head so you can then draw on that at some point in time to, to express things. One of the things that's part of, I think, my success is a sense of responsibility. Well, I'm adopted, so I had these special parents that wanted me. You don't think about it when you're a kid, but in looking back, you know, the specialness of just how much they cared about raising me. My mom, she always encouraged my creativity to the day she died, never stopped believing that her job was to make sure I remembered I'm supposed to be an artist. My dad didn't quite think that was as responsible a path for me, but my mom just never, never let me stop believing that I should always be trying to do something creative, do something artistic. The other piece of my growing up that I'll always be grateful for is I grew up in Southern California. I grew up in the 60s by the beach, surfing. Surfers were thought of as being kind of anti-establishment, non-conformist. You know, we hung out at the beach. And so that kind of free-spirited uh, upbringing and watching the creativity of anything you decide to do, I think, was as inspiring as anything. To believe that anything you do, you should try and do it as imaginatively and as creatively as you possibly can. I had this sense that I wanted to do something creative, something uh, with my artistic talent. So I kept my eye on, on what does that mean? Who should I pay attention to? What should I pay attention to? And, and I grew up watching Walt Disney build Disneyland. It was on television every Tuesday night, and I realized that Walt Disney was, if I was gonna have a hero, that's a pretty good hero. He's an artist, he's creative, and he became this incredibly amazing, innovative uh, businessman. And then to translate it into a place called Disneyland, it was architecture, it was art, it was fantasy, it was creativity, all this stuff rolled into one, and here's this guy who's changing all of our lives in a dramatic way just from his creative enthusiasm for storytelling and believing in the magic of fantasy. I started uh, learning a lot by going through the pages of both Surfer Magazine and Mad Magazine, and that's when I started kind of zeroing in on what I might want to do with, with my ability to do things artistic. I got drafted in the Army and came out of the Army and went back to Long Beach State and discovered this thing called advertising. And I ended up doing production art in a little design studio in Santa Monica. But I was in a real design studio, and so I started learning. Every, every step was trying to consume as much as I could in terms of a sense of how you do this thing, and, and all input was useful input. Everything you do, you have, to, you have to view as part of your education. And the negative experiences sometimes can be more important than the positive experiences. From there, I developed enough of a portfolio to get a job at a place called NW Air. So I saw all these account guys who were the top of the pecking order, going off to lunch, going downstairs, drinking, coming back, telling us what to do. That's where I discovered what I didn't want to do for the rest of my life, is work in a company that, that thought that they were in the keep your client happy service business and the creativity was something that you managed and controlled but you didn't let it get out of hand because it was too unpredictable. I did not want to be this, I grew up surfing for Christ's sake. So I met some amazingly talented people 
as they passed through NW Air, and one of them actually was a guy named Bob Dion, who ended up being kind of one of my mentors. You know, I'd go to I'd go to him, I'd show him my portfolio, and I'd ask him if it was getting better, if it was good, and then at a point in time, I'm watching everything that's going on in New York. Part of the creative energy in New York was Jews and Italians and Greeks and guys that didn't go to Harvard and didn't go to Yale were now taking over the ad business. I'm driven by understanding what Doyle Dane Birnbeck is doing. Bill Birnbeck, kind of like Walt Disney, he understood the whole idea of how creativity is a business idea. He understood this notion that advertising was this interruption in people's lives, and so you better make the, the experience uh, worth remembering, whether it's a print ad that stops you in a magazine or a TV spot that interrupts your TV show. Mama mia. He taught us all that it should be smart, funny, interesting, likable, lovable, memorable, and he encouraged every creative person he could, most of them the ones who went through his company, you know, to push the boundaries of that notion. So you watch these people go through Doyle and Birnbeck and then leave and go form their own agency, whether it's Lois Hall and Calloway or Carl Alley and Amarati and Purist was born later along the way and Mary Wells, first woman to, you know, do major uh, advertising breakthroughs all given permission by Bill Birnbeck and this advertising doesn't have to be stupid, advertising doesn't have to be insulting. Here's Mary Wells, you know, the first woman to kind of emerge as a leader in advertising and she, she took over the marketing communications of an airline called Braniff and she reinvented the airline. She reinvented how they painted their planes and how they dressed their stewardesses. She reinvented the films that they did and the posters that they did, the food that they served. She understood that the totality of a brand is, is something that we could, if we're smart enough, manage. And it's all really advertising, isn't it? So anyway, I'm here on the on the West Coast. Luckily, I discovered, because it was just being born at the time, a place called Shiat Day. I mean, it was small, it was rebellious. They spun their legend of being the creative agency in Los Angeles so well that I just said, I don't know what it's going to take, but that's where I've got to work. So I, I started connecting with this guy called Haya Blanca, who's another amazing influence in my life. He was this cool, self-confident, almost cocky art director, creative director that, that worked with Jay. So he took an inordinate amount of time with me and he went through my book and he gave me this encouragement. He said, I would have hired you right now if... So then I never let up until he finally hired me. I just think because he wanted me to stop bothering him, he hired me. So I got to go meet Jay Shia. Now, talk about, talk about an influence in your life, a mentor, a, a force. He's one of the most amazing motivators, you know, that I've ever dealt with. Him and a guy named Steve Jobs are the two most influential in terms of motivating you to be better than you know you can be or think you can be. I got to go have my first meeting with Jay, and I went in and he said, uh, you're that new guy, right? Yeah, I saw your portfolio. There was a Italian restaurant menu in there that was pretty fun, but I didn't like anything else. Just go do something good. <laughs> and that, that was it, you know. The fact that he found one thing in my portfolio he could say something positive about, I guess, was a good thing. There was this amazing yin-yang at Shia Day called Guy Day and Jay Shiat. Jay Shiat was forever demanding, forever as hard on people as he decided he wanted to be on a given day. And then there's the converse, which is Guy Day, who always was sensitive to creative people being sensitive human beings and, and sometimes needing some uh, kind and gentle 
motivation and inspiration. He still wanted to do great work. He still loved great work. He was probably a better writer than, than Jay. But he was, I guess you could call it good cop, bad cop, but it wasn't an act. This is who, how, who Guy really was. Jay just constantly challenged you to make it better, challenged you. We, we had T-shirts that said, good enough is not enough, and it kind of came out of the spirit of the way Jay looked at everything. It's not good enough. It's, it can be better. We're trying to compete with the stuff that we see in New York. So Jay just became this lifelong motivation in terms of proving I was better than that Italian uh, menu that he liked. Never quite letting you believe that you'd convinced him. <laughs> so you had to continue to try and prove it every, every day. But then the other incredibly fortunate thing in my life is Jay uh, went up to Silicon Valley and met a kid named Steve Jobs and every bit as full of himself and self-confident as he was his whole life, believing that he could change the world, that this technology that he loved and understood was going to be world-changing. I believe the reason he named Apple Apple is because he has had this intuition that he was going to introduce the world to technology that was going to change their lives. And it had to be as, as accessible and comfortable a brand as it could possibly be to invite people in. Steve loved marketing and I met up with him when he was just embarking on changing the world. and. He could be as tough, if not tougher, on people than Jay. He was always demanding that it be better, always demanding that it be breakthrough, different, ah, that looks like shit like everybody else does. I want. He always wanted something uh, that pushed the envelope that was special. And for whatever reason, he and I built a long trust that I wanted to do what he wanted to do. If he believed that in your heart you cared about the same stuff he cared about, he would give over that trust. Johnny Ives got it, I got it, uh, John Lasseter, Pixar. Uh, so I feel myself in very rare company that I got, got to be one of those trusted people. So what an amazing opportunity that was. Well, Steve Jobs figured out by expressing it through the brand he built that everything a brand does is advertising. Every gesture that is seen by the public, seen by the audience for the brand, has to add up to another, another piece of information that makes you decide how you feel about that brand. And I think in today's world, the brands that the brands that I admire the most are the ones that understand the essence of who they are and everything they do is interesting and smart and likable. So to work for a brand like Apple, which didn't, didn't just do a few good ads or just didn't have one interesting product, but consistently made products that changed everything and then did advertising that kind of engaged and introduced you to, to those products and those ideas. And to be part of that whole continuum was amazing. But as I said, Steve, his expectations were always, you know, this high. So he, most of you know the story, he was pushed out of his, his company after launching Macintosh by a soda pop salesman who thought he was smarter than Steve. And uh, through a series of CEOs that almost put the company out of business, Steve came back to the company in 1997, and one of the most exciting phone calls I ever got in my life was Steve calling me. I was driving along in my car, actually. Guess what? Emilio just resigned and I'm gonna be CEO at Apple. Can you come up and help me? What a, what a moment in time. And then, I'll be right up, you know, and then the panic sets in. Shit, he's gonna wanna do something to save this company and he wants me to help. So here's the, here's the challenge of your life. The first thing he asked me to do is uh, come up here with some ideas. So the reality was their product line wasn't that inspiring anymore. It was a bunch of beige boxes. But 
I knew enough about Steve's heart and his passion and what he cared about, the creativity that he tried to build into the first Macintosh, the, the celebration of creative people, that we sat down and in a long weekend, we invented this thing called Think Different. And it was kind of throwing down the gauntlet to the company and telling the world that Apple wasn't going to go out of business. And it did this crazy celebration of, of, of genius in the world. And at the same time, it, uh, it reminded Apple who they were and what they cared about, what their values were. Interestingly, we painted a picture of the kind of company that Steve Jobs now definitely belongs in, in terms of these people changed the world, and that was the end of the commercial. People who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do, and he did. So the, the reason I haven't retired is, is I can't give up on the, how inspiring it is to go in every day and be around young, creative people and their energy and their passion and, and how much they care. You know, it reminds me of when I was young and to be around that is, is incredibly stimulating. One of the other very lucky parts of my life and, and I guess if you look at statistics, most people aren't uh, as lucky as me, but if you can find uh, a life partner who loves you, encourages you, believes in what you're trying to do and, and lets you go off even when you, they think you're uh, kind of over the top obsessive about something, but lets you go off and, and, and pursue your passion, your dream, you're a very lucky person. I've been married 45 years to the same person and I probably wouldn't have accomplished what I did if I didn't have a partner like that. That's all one sentence. Think you can cut that together? <laughs> yeah. <laughs>